This is episode number 75 featuring Pastel Master, Nancy King Mertz. Welcome to the Plen Air Podcast from Plen Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. Inside the Plen Air Podcast, we dig deeply into the world of outdoor painting called Plen Air Painting. If you don't happen to know the term, it's French, essentially meaning outdoors. The French say Plen Air, others say Plain Air, but it doesn't matter how you say it. It's a huge movement of artists going outside to paint. We call it the New Golf. This show is about that movement. I want to thank everyone again for coming to the Plein Air Convention a couple of weeks ago. It was fantastic. I just, it's like the the effect hasn't worn off yet. I just want to be there hanging out with everybody. It was so much fun. Podcast is brought to you by my Publishers Invitational Paint Camp coming up this June. It's summer camp for artists. We basically paint together all day for a full week. Adirondack Mountains are one of the best kept secrets of uh, America. Just stunningly beautiful. You'll come up for a week of painting. You're going to leave with 15, 20, 25, 30 paintings that you've done. You're going to fine tune yourself by painting together for a week. And there's no workshops or anything, but you're painting with some other incredible painters. Some of them are really famous, and you're just kind of all side by side hanging out, painting together. We have a couple of groups, uh, easy roadside access, beautiful places, and some who have to climb a little bit, but not a lot. Anyway, everybody's invited. There's no invitation required. And it's beginners or pros and everybody in between. And we just hang out. We sing. We dance. We paint portraits. We, we uh, play guitar. We just have a lot of fun. And so uh, everybody's welcome. We have a big party on the lake the last night. And... It's just something really special. I've been doing it now for eight or nine years, and I don't know how much longer I'm going to do it because it's kind of time for a change. But anyway, uh, all your meals and rooms are included. You roll out of bed and you paint three, four, five, six, twelve, eighteen, twenty 12, 18, 20 paintings a day. Not really. Uh, you can learn more at publishersinvitational.com. Well, it's my desire to see more people fall in love with plein air painting and you can help by sharing the podcast with your friends on social media email etc and of course we hope you'll subscribe on itunes or whatever you use and if you have feedback email me eric at plenairmagazine.com the interview is underwritten by another trip i'm doing because i love to take people painting the african painting safari this is a bucket list trip a lot of people going. It's going to be a lot of fun. A chance to go to Africa on safari. How often are you going to do that on your own? Never. Right. But you've always wanted to do it. We're going to get out there, take photographs. We're going to paint. Uh, we're going to be in beautiful uh, luxury accommodations. Do sightseeing around Africa. Painting. Painting pretty much every day. We're going to be out in the bush. We're going to see the amazing mountains, the waterfalls. Places like Victoria Falls, which is one of the great wonders of the world. Kind of makes Niagara Falls look like a stream. Anyway, pretty incredible trip. Bring your spouse, your partner. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a blast. We have some seats left, but you got to get your paperwork done because there is a visa or something required, and you got to have a passport too. So the trip is coming up in September, and you can learn more at AfricanPaintingSafari.com. Well, how about we get right into this interview about pastel painting and plein air painting with Nancy King Mertz. Nancy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Eric. Good to hear from you. Hope everything's good. Your family's good. Your puppy dog and everything <laughs> in Austin. <laughs> well, puppy dog's having a hard time. I'm afraid uh, oh, what dear. Nancy's referring to is that we adopted a, uh, an 11-year-old pound dog. <laughs> And he's just been a delightful change in our life. But unfortunately, we just learned that he's got uh, massive tumors throughout, riddled throughout his body. So we're not oh. sure how much longer he's going to be around. But on that high note. <laughs> well, you've given him a great, you know, end of life. He's, he's a lucky dog. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's the goal here. So are you a pet yeah. person? Oh, yes. 
yes, we have a dog, 10-year-old dog that we adore. And um, yes, I I am quite the pet person and it kills me to, to leave her. So I'm always all over anyone else's pet when, <laughs> when I travel. <laughs> well, you and I had a wonderful opportunity. You were down here in Austin, actually two different times to shoot a bunch of videos uh, with our company. And uh, we really had a great opportunity to get acquainted, get to know one another. We even had a chance to paint together in, in yeah. model, model session for the Bee Cave Painters one night. And uh, so that's been a real pleasure getting to know you. I, uh, but I wanted, as part of this, to help our, our listeners get to know you a little bit uh, because um, you're such a sweet person and such an accomplished artist. And I thought it'd be fun to just kind of chat and help everybody understand well, a little more about you. what I've learned about you. So uh, I wanted to start, though. Um, I just saw you posted like a medal and some ribbons and some kind oh, of, yeah. <laughs> you just got some major, uh, major deal. Tell us about that. Well, I, I was so excited. Of course, I had to immediately post it to my Facebook friends, but um I am uh, a member of like three or four different pastel societies in the country. Uh, one is Pastel so Society of America, which is based in New York, and um, I do workshops for them and demos and so forth. And then Degas Pastel Society, of course, the Chicago Pastel Painters. Um, and then over that, all those groups is the International Association of Pastel Painters. So it's a worldwide organization um, that is just the umbrella over all the pastel organizations in the world. And so you get points and so forth, and you you get a master circle after so many points. And I was notified this week that I was named one of their eminent pastelists, which there are there were eight that I found ahead of me um, on their website. So I'm just, I was blown away and thought that was something that would happen years down the road. So I don't know who's doing their math, but <laughs> that somebody counted up enough points, I guess, um, to get me that distinction. So, so what does that mean? What, uh, well, forgive me for, just, for not understanding, know. but obviously it's a big deal, but what will it mean in terms of your career and how it helps or does it? Well, you know, when you get, when you um, attain master pastel status, that's something that you can sign, um, you know, you have initials after your name and it just, I don't know, gives you a little more credibility in your chosen medium. Um, so, I don't know, eminent pastelists just might get me a better table at a restaurant. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it just, I don't know, it just, I think, boosts you up a little bit in, in, uh, in people taking your work seriously. <laughs> well, I think that's a nice honor. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, you and I had a lot of discussion about pastel painting, and you actually very graciously gave me a set of pastels uh, you have uh, two different sets of pastels that were produced by Richardson, Jack Richardson Company. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them, I think, was called the Landscape Series, and the other maybe was like the Urban something, Urban yeah, Sketching. It's urban set, yeah. Yeah. So and, I, um, did I get the names you right? That? You did. You did. So I haven't actually broken broken them open and used them yet, and you also gave me, or very generous, gave me a panel that kind of feels like sandpaper. So I'm going to just kind of approach this from, from the perspective of somebody who may not be a pastel painter yet, uh, because you, interestingly enough, don't do just pastels. You sometimes do other painting as well. You do oil painting from time to time. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, I'm working on an oil right now. Um, just before you called, I put the brush down. So. Um, yeah, I grew up as an oil painter, and um, you know, I've, I've painted all my life. I started when I was a kid, and then someone gave me a set of pastels in '88, and I just, I just fell in love with them because they're so immediate. And uh, there's a, 
we do a lot of education about pastels when we're out there painting in the field because people will walk up and say, oh, you're painting in chalk. And we'll say, no, it's actually pure pigment. So it's the same pigment that's in oil. It just doesn't have oil in it. So um, it's, it's the purest form of paint that there is because there's nothing um, that cuts it. You know, it's just... It's just compressed pigment. So you hold it in your hand, you know, like you would chalk. So I guess that's why people think it's chalk. But So what um, is the difference it, between pastel and chalk? Chalk probably is is pigment mixed in with some kind of a chalk uh, car- actually, carbon carbonate or something like that? It's actually limestone mixed with dye. So there's, you know, that's what you use on the sidewalk or what kids use in school, it's, it's just nothing, there's nothing permanent or um, really um, there's no saturated color with that. And people often think pastel, you know, is a soft, sweet, um, dreamy kind of medium. And it can be that, but it, you can make a pastel painting just as strong and as bold as an oil painting. Um, The colors are so brilliant. You can, just layer them on top of each other, and the eye kind of does the mixing. You don't mix them on your palette. Um, your eye just kind of mixes them. And uh, they never fade. They never crack. Um, you do have to protect them with glass, but it's it's really considered the most durable medium as long as you use a good, sturdy archival surface, sanded surface that that holds them. So the sanded surface is really designed to kind of pull the pigment off the the stick and make it make it kind of stay right right uh well i i'm you got it okay well i you know it's i sometimes i get it um (laughs) so i i think that what i'm trying to understand is so it i have friends who who buy their own pigments and mix their own oil paints daniel graves in florence at the florence academy is one of those people and his claim is that he gets more pure, brilliant color by doing it that way than by, um, you know, buying tubed paint. His theory being that tube paints, you know, they have to grind things too thin to get them to mix into the linseed oils, et cetera, uh, to go through the machines. Um, so essentially, you're really getting even a more pure form of color and intensity with pastels because it's really is pure pigment. Yeah, it is. And you really can, you know, push, use a heavy hand, push it into the surface. And again, as long as you have a good sturdy painting surface that will withstand abuse, um, you can just layer it on very thickly. Um, Maria Marino does a lot of that. Um, her, her paintings are so textural and they're all pastel, but they, they just, it's layers and gobs and globs of pastel and they're just so rich. Does anybody ever take the, the pastels that they've, they've put on paper and then try to use paint brushes over them, smear them, you put some linseed oil on them to create more of a paint like effect? Uh, or is that just kind of like silly? Well, I always use um, a paintbrush in the early stages. I you, you work actually dark to light like you do with oil painting. So I will um, kind of indicate a, a map on the surface with just little, I call it tick marks of charcoal. And so when I know I have the composition um, going the direction I want it to go, uh, and that just takes about five or ten minutes, then I'll start putting in some darks and I don't apply those very heavily um, because I want to keep them kind of transparent. And then I'll use um, a fan brush. Again, it's a Richardson fan brush because I've found it to be the most durable. And um, I use denatured alcohol and I kind of smear those darks around and it has a real brushy effect because I'm using the fan brush and that a lot of those brushy strokes come through in the final painting. So I do really recommend to my students that they 
try this method and it loosens up the work you know so often pastel is is very tight and people blend and blend and blend and you you kind of lose the the nature of the medium because it's it's so blended um so i like to see the strokes and have your eye do the blending rather than your fingertip and uh it's just a, it's a real exciting medium. It's it's great for for plein air because it is so rapid. You don't have to you know stand and mix paint. You can just grab the color you need, apply it, and keep going. So, so, so why uh, do you do both? It, um, do you, in what cases do you find you're using oil? What cases it pastel? Is it because you're looking for a certain effect or feel? Well, I I love to do a lot of architectural city things and I I can do them so quickly with pastel and I have a little more control because the pigment is at the end of my fingers rather than at the end of a brush and I'm just able to to get those verticals uh, a little more true um, just because I have a, a steadier hand than I do when I'm holding a brush I see um, just easier to control and you can use the edges and um, I use the side with a big swipe and use the tip and you know they, they're just real versatile okay and what would be your um, your pitch if you will you and I were talking about why you thought it would be a good thing for for oil painters plein air painters to try a pastel painting what would be your pitch well, I think it's it's just fun to see how quickly a painting can come together with pastel. Plus, the the brilliance of the color is really something um, to behold. You know, you just so often, uh, and I struggle with this all the time. I'll do a painting that I really like, and then I look at it in a couple of days, and it's kind of sunken in in different areas. And you never have that with pastel. Yeah. Um, it just retains the brilliance always. Cool. So how did this all painting, this painting adventure begin for you? Uh, you said earlier that you started when you were a kid. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Well, my parents always joked and said my first sentence was, I want an easel. So um, I grew up in a very small town and they took me to another town for classes when I was um, a very, very young girl. And, you know, I still have some of those, they're like finger paintings almost. Um, and I just, uh, I don't know, I was always the kid in school that everybody would say, well, can you draw this for me? You know, so I was just always drawing and painting and um, started oil painting in high school. Uh, again, you know, in a very small town, didn't have a lot of... Um, exposure to art or a lot of opportunities for art instruction in school, but I did start taking some extension courses from the University of Illinois, which was nearby when I was in high school, and then that's what I studied in college and grad school was painting. So it's just been my lifelong and, ambition and vision. And, and how did you become a, a professional? What, what was the transition for you? Well, um, I, when I was in grad school, I started teaching painting and um, on the college level, and then I was hired as uh, faculty for a couple of years. And then I realized I just wasn't painting enough uh, for myself. And I, I, by this time, had opened a gallery in our town, and I was showing my work and other others, and... Uh, entering some competitions and so forth. So uh, I guess once you really claim it as your life's focus, I, I think you consider yourself a professional when you're trying to make a living <laughs> from, from your art. And you've done very well. You've been a professional now, you said, how many years? Oh, gosh, I don't want to tell you how old I am. <laughs> uh, well, you're not old. <laughs> Uh, well, golly, I've been painting since, uh, 
ooh, probably the 60s, sometime well, in the 60s, because yeah. I started when I was really young. And, and you've, but you've been very successful. You and I were talking about uh, some of the sacrifices that you've had to make from a marketing perspective and the hard work that you've had to make uh, or, 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 or do in the Chicagoland area, uh, which is, of course, where you're based, where your gallery is. But um, it, I thought that what you said to me about the effort that you uh, that took you a while to kind of establish yourself, maybe you tell people a little about that because I found that to be fascinating. Do you remember what we talked about? No, I don't. But, yeah. well, um, it's because you were drinking. Um, oh. <laughs> well, we, ta- we we were talking about how you went out to the various Chamber of Commerce meetings and you just kind of became... Oh, yes, yes. So tell, so tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I, you know, growing up in a small town, I was always very involved in the community and I had a gallery there and, you know, and I was on the Chamber of Commerce and and different uh, organizations and always promoting um, our store and uh, which I had to do because we were in a little out of the way town. Um, So then when we moved to Chicago, I kind of did the same thing. I got involved with our, our local chambers and, you know, attended a lot of meetings just to get our name out there. And for a while I operated my business out of our home and then um, realized that, you know, we needed to have more of a presence and um, a place where people could come without making an appointment and all that. So um, our gallery has been in the same location for 15 years now and we're open seven days a week and I'm still out there hustling and um, and I do e-blasts and, um, direct mail and lots of ads in Planner Magazine oh, and Pastel I Journal. Uh-huh. And I, I really do think because of the print advertising, I've, I've secured all these workshops around the country. And um, I just taught one in Croatia last fall. <clears throat> I'm supposed to have one in France this year. So I'm hoping that one fills so we can uh, go ahead with that. But you know, it's just amazing how um, people see your name repeatedly and then they associate your work, you know, just they may not know your face, but when they see your name, they, you know, a style or a, a genre or whatever will pop into their heads because they've seen your your name and your work repeatedly in print. So, you know, I'm a big believer in advertising and well, we, you know, this this is something that I teach in my marketing uh, thing, and that is that the importance of repetition. And um, I believe that uh, marketing is a lifetime journey. Is as long as you're a painter, then you're a marketer. And what what I yeah. think tends to happen is I know a lot of people who got very famous and 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 got pretty big and were selling a lot of paintings. And we're in a lot of galleries. I've interviewed some of them, and the story that I frequently hear is, um, you know, they were making more money than they ever thought possible, and they were just doing really well, and then all of a sudden it ended. And the one thing that ended is that they got overly confident, thinking that, okay, I've arrived now. I don't need to do any of this stuff anymore. You, on the other hand, have realized that this is a lifetime commitment, that you, as long as you're in business, you have to keep marketing your your artwork or your gallery or, or uh, visitation to your location, et cetera. And that, that seems to be the one thing that a lot of people seem to not understand. Yeah. Well, technically I've, I've been in retail, gosh, for almost 40 years. (laughs) So, you know, you, you just have to keep getting your name out there no matter what your retail is. So what's it like, uh, being in a, um, what's the dream of the owner, uh, the gallery that's owned by the artist? Uh, what are the upsides? What are the downsides? I, I would imagine one of the downsides is it's open seven days a week. <laughs> well, we do have good staff that that um, help us stay open seven days a week. Um, but it is a, a huge work commitment. You know, I have to keep the 
the shop's stocked with art, and I still do a lot of framing and, um, you know, of all types of things. You know, I love to frame unusual pieces of art, but I'm framing football jerseys too. <laughs> so, you know, you just have to be willing to do whatever it takes to um, keep your business alive and and uh, budget for advertising and be thinking always about your your next marketing move. Uh, what's the an interesting story you can tell the people that follow you or are interested? Um, you know, just have to to be very, very proactive and and trying to keep your brand alive. And you have to think of it as a brand. Um, you know, if if you're not doing this, no no one else will. You know, even if if you become very well known, um, it's it's got to be you that's that keeps the word going. So let's talk about going outdoors. Um, you are a plein air painter. Um, mm -hmm. How much of your work is is studio versus outdoors? You obviously live in a place where it's cold part of the year. Do you go outdoors in the winter, or do you pretty much stick indoors? Uh, I go outside a little bit. I just um, went to the American Impressionist show in Cincinnati last weekend, and we had a paint out, and it was like 32. <laughs> there was snow on the ground. We were all frozen. But, um, you know, if you can bucket up for a couple of hours and and just wear clothing to keep yourself warm. Um, I would say about 70% of my work is plein air. I teach a lot of plein air workshops. So I'm, I always do a demo with those. Um, and then I, you know, I just love to to travel and paint. So I get out there a lot. I, I produce a lot of work and, um, I just, I, I don't know. I, I feel such a strong connection to the work when it's created plein air. Cause you just remember everything. You remember the, the sounds and, and people that, that come up to you and the, and the, what the weather was like. And, you know, there's all those things are associated with that particular painting. So it's just a much greater connection. So how do you communicate all of that that feel into a painting? How, how uh, and you do, I don't know how you do it, but when you look at, uh, we, we have a, a, a video that we just produced of, of your work on painting bridges, um, which is kind of an introductory video for people kind of early stage um, pastelists. But you, when you look at that painting, you can hear the noise uh, on that busy street. You can feel the emotion of that place. But I have no idea how you capture that. Is there, is there a, um, a means of doing that? I wanted to say a trick, but I'm not so sure tricks exist. Well, I, I think, well, of course, that piece that's on the video was done in your studio in Austin. So I, I was not actually plein air painting that, but... Um, I have done so much plein air painting that I think that uh, translates over into the work that you do in the studio. Um, you know, you just remember what the color of things in the far distance and, um, you know, you, you kind of remember the, the sense of, of the atmosphere um, that surrounds objects and the color that is created, you know, photos give you, even though they're color photos, shadows are black and the light is white. And um, when you have the plein air experience under your belt, that just helps you introduce color into those black and white areas that you see in photos. So it's just, it's just that experience of doing it over and over and over that, that helps you makes create sense. something that's, it makes sense? Yeah, makes sense. You said, good, good. <laughs> so um, tell me, uh, in, in terms of teaching, because you, you do a lot of teaching, uh, a lot of workshops, um, what do you think are the things that, that you find are lacking people 
are most in need of understanding. Uh, do you find patterns when you go to a group of people and realize that there's something that's missing? Well, you know, I always say drawing is the key to everything. So people need to have a good understanding of um, anatomy, perspective, uh, form. So if if they can't draw, it's really hard to paint. You just can't make things work. Um, so that's I, I tell people to you know pick up a book on perspective and and do some, some exercises with perspective, uh, just to draw and draw and draw. And uh, people come into the gallery and say, "Well, I want to paint like you," and I'll say, "Well, have you done much drawing?" You know and and many will say, no, I just want to paint. And I'll say, well, <laughs> you've got to do some drawing to make your, your painting work. So that's kind of my, I don't know, my advice to people. But um, I was really lucky when I was in college to take a, an architectural drafting class from uh, the dean of architecture at the U of I. And that helped so much. You know, we studied the, the perspective of shadows and and um, a series of staircases and, you know, all, all these things that really do um, help you learn to draw and, and to see perspective. So there's some good books out there, and I, I highly recommend that the people that want to do urban or do architectural renderings at all um, – study a little architecture to, or perspective to get the architecture right. Are there any particular uh, books on perspective that you that you happen to love? Uh, well, there's the Perspective for Artists. Uh, it's available from Dover Books. It's uh, paperback, so it's not real expensive, and that's one I used in college. I'm glad after all these eons it's still available. <laughs> um but yeah, it's it's a real good uh, book with some exercises, and I just highly recommend anyone so, who wants to do urban painting and and architecture that they look at that book or a book, do some architectural and perspective uh, sketching. And you've you've been you've been painting for well over forty years. Um, which yeah. means you started when you were two, and <laughs> and uh, so if if knowing what you know now, if you had to do it all over again, and you were advising your niece or nephew or let's say somebody, you know, and they're twenty five or thirty, what would you say your track should be? What should you follow? What should you be doing to get good as uh, as accomplished as rapidly as possible? Well, I I think back on little segments of time when I I didn't produce work. You know, I was um, establishing a business when we lived downstate and representing all these artists, and I I wasn't painting a lot, and so I felt like I had a like about a seven year gap, and I would advise a, a young artist to not let a gap occur, even if you're, you know, busy doing a, a job that's not art related at all. At least I was in an art related job and building a business, but, um, just always carve out time to, to hone your craft and just keep painting and, uh, you know, and try to sell your work because that, that seems to validate it. I think, um, in your mind and, and inspires you. Plus it gives you some money to go buy more supplies. All right. So I would just say, try to never have a, a gap. Keep doing it no matter what. Right. Right. Uh, so that would be ABP. Always be painting. Yes. Yes. Or always be drawing. Right. Uh, and well, I, I do do that now. So I just, I, I 
can't not paint. You know, I just and if I if I start to get crabby, my husband will say, "Why don't you go paint something? You're kind of crabby." <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's so, nice, you know, nice just, to know that about you if you ever get crabby. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I can get crabby, Eric. <laughs> I, I, you're like the most sunshiny, cheerful person I've ever met. So. <laughs> most times when I'm painting. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what would you have done if you weren't, if you couldn't have become an artist? Is there something else that you always wanted to think about? You know, no. Um, I, I always felt like I needed to have a business to support, you know, what I wanted to do. So I, I did start the framing business um, when I was in college because I knew I'd be painting a lot and needing lots of frames for myself. And then I thought, well, this will be a good thing to work with other artists and and just the public uh, to stay in touch with them and not just be totally holed up in a studio. Um, so I've, I've just always had that focus. Um, and I, I do really enjoy customers and, you know, meeting with people and clients and so forth. So if I hadn't done that, I think I would have been sorry, but I, I really am not sorry about the path that I've taken at all. I really don't have anything to change. All right. Well, I'm glad glad to hear that. That's it. That was a trick question. We were just testing you to make sure that <laughs> you were you were fully committed for the next forty years. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Lord willing. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, this has been a delight today. Uh, it's it's fun to uh, share a little bit about you with others. Um, is there something that we haven't touched on that perhaps might be of value to our our listeners that you want to talk about? Hmm, I don't think so. I I've sure enjoyed my my visits with you and and time with you and and appreciate all you do to help us advance and stay on track. So um, well, you're very kind. Thank you know, you. I always get a lot out of your your marketing and your Sunday coffees. Those are always fun to read and very inspirational. Sometimes they're very sad, but <laughs> we all have those moments in our lives. And I'm it's, it's so nice depressed. To, no, it's just it's <laughs> nice to see it put down, you know, on paper or whatever online, so we can share. Some of those things yeah well nancy thank you for your time today and and for inspiring us with your paintings where can people find your artwork well since you ask uh, my website is nancy king com, and nancy is spelled n-a-n-c-i-e mertz nancy king k-i-n-g mertz m-e-r-t-z dot ah. com I'm glad you said that because I would have thought you, M U. So good. Nancy oh King, no. N A N C I E King M E R T Z. Correct. Yeah. Well, uh, Nancy, thank you for doing this today, and um, we will see you on the other side, wherever that is. Okay. We'll see you on the All right, Eric. Okay. Thanks a million. Well, thanks again to Nancy King Mertz for doing this. The podcast was brought to you by my. Publishers Invitational Art Retreat in the Adirondack Mountains this June. Still should have some seats left. Publishersinvitational.com. I kind of want to sing it. Dot com. And also by the African Painting Safari that we're taking in September. What a way to do September. Wow. AfricanPaintingSafari.com. And if you have not seen my Sunday morning coffee blog, it's kind of a place where I don't necessarily talk about what I talk about all the other times. It's just kind of stuff and things. Check it out. It's called Sunday Coffee. You can find it at coffeewitheric.com. That's me, Eric. Coffeewitheric.com. Well, plein air painting is the largest movement in the history of art, according to Jean Stern from the Irvine Museum. Largest 
movement in the history of art. And this painting's about the movement. Lots and lots of people coming into it all the time. It's why Plein Air Magazine is doing so well. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you making us number one at Barnes & Noble in the art category. So drop by, pick one up, or you can get a subscription of your own at pleinairmagazine.com. And come back next week. We've got somebody else fun, and it's going to be great. Let's do this soon. I'll see you then. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. Remember, it's a great big world out there that you need to go paint. We'll see you. Goodbye-bye.